growing up here, you know, as a little kid, this was like town was busy as it was, you know, it's like how you imagine Queen Street. That's how I saw it. To me, this was the world. I left Niue when I was four years old. Late 70s, 78, 79, went to New Zealand, started school. Coming back now, seeing all the empty houses, you know, hardly any people around. I suppose to non Nuans, you know, if you look at it as, a, you know, as in terms of a state of a country, it's not doing very well. It's actually, you know, poorly. But to me, I don't see any of that. To me, it's just home and we're still here. And as long as we're still here, you can always come back. You know, if you're not dead, you can always come back. Hello! How am I day? How am I How am I day? This is my auntie Asale, my mother's younger sister, and one of my anchors to the motu. No for me o gava sele he teu fitua. Si fetani o gava sele. Si fono fono o e o me tro ha ko deva faetama. Ko no for ni o indiwe ko fano ni o ke visitai to tamaku. The stories of the ones who stayed aren't that many anymore. The ones who remain on the motu. Those who keep alive the culture and traditions that might otherwise be lost. My auntie is one of them. How how mitak? La to ke haka ke tamu ka taro e. Aya. Tu ki long ke ta hok. E ki chef oi ni we ai ke ni we ya. There were many reasons for those who left and just as many for those who stayed. You think you're gonna live in Niue forever? Yes, I will. Why? Because I love my island. This is where I born. <laughs> <laughs> As we celebrate New Way's 50th anniversary, on Ono Ke Tonga Shifari, we don't have to long to go home here, we don't have to go home here, we E tō ngā lova ngā hau, tō wānga whakamotu, tō mase hila mui tō mena pihia. I hope knowing where we are will help with where we're going. What are we celebrating this coming 50th jubilee, Niwe Pule Whakamotu? The young Niwe's here, we struggle, right, with our culture and our language, and it's like, you just look at the stats, there's 11% of us out of all of the Niwe's in New Zealand and Niwe that can speak Vanho Niwe. If we lose our language, that means we'll lose our identity. I've always felt like the minority amongst the minorities. Right, there's more students here at Manirio High than there are people in Niwe, though. Whenever you find out someone's Niwe, and it's like, hello. Oi! Oh, my love! New Zealand provides us with a lot of um, support and security, but that comes with strings attached. I got to my Albert Grammar School and I was expelled for having an Afro. We are conned by the food and the taste of sweets from New Zealand, eh? I think the relationship with New Zealand is one of dependence, not independence. You can't be independent while still putting your hand out. What's next for us as new people? There were dire predictions uh, in 1974 that it was only a matter of time before the last person to leave the island will have to turn out the lights. There was definitely an air of anticipation uh, this was this was something of an adventure for us. After so many years of being administered by New Zealand, we were going to be able to decide our own future, where our little canoe was going. Well, people say that self-government was the undoing of New Air. I think the problem was we wanted to be 
politically independent to show our identity as a New Air people, but we also wanted to hold on to the New Zealand passport, like we wanted the cake and we wanted to eat it, you know? Because that made it easier for people to leave. And the net effect, of course, is huge uh, population loss. This combined with the opening of the new airport in 1971 increased migration to the lands of the long white cloud. Many underestimated the impact of this on the motu. If they want to go, let them go. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are here because we want to be here. I have no wish to be anywhere else, even if it drops to three and a half thousand. Who cares? I mean, we can still carry on. I think there's enough people here to do the work. When we had over 3,000 people, the island was actually very alive and vigorous and full of life. And then people slowly started moving to New Zealand. Our population was decreasing to a stage where uh, it may not be viable for us to exist as a country. Part of having the constitution, you know, that relationship with New Zealand was that all the villages would get power and water. So I remember the village before us got their power and them getting lights. And I was waiting like, oh yeah, I can't wait till our village gets our electricity, gets our taps running. Yeah, but before all that happened, me and my nana and my cousins moved to New Zealand. This promised land of milk and honey saw many new Wayans join the wave of Pacific Islanders wanting a life in Aotearoa. Dad came first to work and he would promised uh, mum back in the islands that um, he'd send for her, which he did, and brought mum and the sister over on the Tofu. A few years later, I was born uh, here. So both of them came for a better life. After my father died, we moved from Newton into Ponsonby. Still hard for mum raising three children on her own on a widow's benefit. I was ducks at Newton Central. I was ducks at Kofa Intermediate. I got to Mount Albert Grammar School and I was expelled for having an afro. At that time in the early 1970s, to have an afro for a young Pacific Island boy, that's our identity. Uh, we go now where we got frizzy hair. That to me was the awakening of getting politicised. I read, read profusely. All that reading led Tingy to co-found the Polynesian Panthers fighting for indigenous rights, often in volatile situations. 300 years and we've been named in atlases, at schools, taught in books and culture, or that knew it as the Savage Island, named by this fellow, Captain Cook. He named Tonga the Friendly Islands, Samoa the Navigator Islands, and he called us the Savage Islands. The name Savage Island pretty much stuck until the late 1800s when King Dongia wrote to Queen Victoria asking for protection from black birders, who were mostly from her empire. This led to New Air's annexation by New Zealand in 1901. During World War I, approximately 150 New Wayan men, representing 10% of the island's male population, were recruited by the empire and sent to war. Few came back. New Air was then largely left alone until the assassination of New Zealand High Commissioner Hector Larson in 1953. This brought eyes back on New Air, and by now the question, what to do with New Air? In 1974, New Wayans were presented with three options, independence, self-government, or remain a New Zealand territory. Even though New Air had initially asked for protection from the empire, not everyone was keen to maintain this connection. I like Full independence. Manakola Hioke, Puri for a motu, I put a for a motu on your way, total independence. I didn't like this half shaped independence. Yeah, with New Zealand and other people with their hands on, eh, and influence us. We are conned by the food and the, and the taste of sweets and things like that from New Zealand, eh. Once you lose your culture, you lose your nation. The result of the referendum went 65 to 35 percent for self-government. And on October 19, 1974, Niue became self-governing in free association with New Zealand. Niue is a realm country and it has a very special relationship with New Zealand. Tokelau, Niue and Cook Islanders are all New Zealand citizens and have the fundamental rights of New Zealanders while being in a self-governing arrangement. And it's quite special. If you look around the world, uh, without boasting, and with all our mistakes we might have made, 
it is probably superior to any other arrangement anywhere else in the world. I'm one who don't think we've really benefited from it, to be honest. We could have bitten the bullet, refused citizenship, and forced us as a people to make a go at it without relying on New Zealand. I think the relationship with New Zealand is one of dependence, not independence. With so little resources, Niwea these days depends a lot on tourism. Challenging when it's not the classic tropical island marketed by Western travel agents. We don't have the white sandy beaches like our Pacifica neighbours. One thing we do share is climate change. It's a breathless morning after, but the indiscriminate fury of Cyclone Hatter is all too apparent. The waves uh, came in with the cyclone and just wiped us all out, both sides of the road. Cyclone Hatter was a Category 5 cyclone. We're still recovering from that, but that one incident in four hours essentially wiped out our only hospital records and justice system. It took our only museum off the face of the earth. We'll never get that Taonga back. We lost our bulk fuel depot, which was down on the wharf, and that overnight doubled our fuel bill as a country, and it has remained double as a result. One of the big challenges we're going to face beyond the impacts of climate change is how do we switch to renewable energies and renewable energy infrastructure and development opportunities without the necessary capital to do that. As the rest of the world transitions, our islands start buying up all of the obsolete technology that's cheaper and is coming down. And we've had 30 years of experience in this space when the world went Digital, we bought up all the analogue phones for a dollar each and they were obsolete in a year. Niwe has been trying to switch to solar power since 2013, but it's a tricky process. There's been challenges integrating it with the existing system because it's so old. There's also no public transport in Niwe. Everybody has their own car, so that's a lot of fuel and a dependency that doesn't look like letting up. It's a cut before the horse process. You cannot be independent without being self-sustaining. You can't be independent while still putting your hand out. Niwe needs to put his hand up first to be able to do stuff instead of relying more on the putting the hand out. Imani Fakaoshi Manawa Louis is a current member of the Niwe Assembly and son of former Niwe Premier Frank Louis. One of the pioneers in bringing internet connectivity to Niue, he plays a vital role in the island's digital development through his ISP company, Kanu Native Broadband. He's also the founder of Makanet, the first Pacific-owned internet service provider in New Zealand. I always intended to have a business myself. That was my aspiration, my dream. Hey, <laughs> Fia <laughs> Your country can only be livable and sustainable if you have the people. And of course you're going to have the right people with the right skill sets and the like. Api was born in New Zealand and came to Niue very young. Apart from a few years in New Zealand for mechanics qualification, he's managed to live his whole life on the motu. Si si kamata e motu ru mo ya tofite da ngane kamata e mata kau ge ge lari ge ke tukutu ho fe numela e Niwayans have a long tradition of subsistence living. Most Niwayans have their own plantations, which also serves as a second source of income. It's a lifestyle under threat on many fronts. Kumi, Kumi, Tungehara, Ayinga, Ulla, Hikabe, Ukwehara, 
As more and more of our youngsters become well educated, uh, uh, they look beyond the horizon and they see New Zealand and they say, well, look, we, we, we need to go and experience the outside world. Center of the town with a kind of gay lady. Huh. Yeah, we're the sick. Pull up to the bar, whole squad came with me. Huh. Niwe's biggest resource has always been people. But when 80% of those people are born in a different country, connections are hard to maintain. Huh. Whenever you find out someone's Niwe, and it's like a little. Oh. Oi! Oh, my love! <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it's a special, it's, it's like a, it's a tight knit community because we're. It's, ah, it's not many of us. I got the I've always felt like the minority amongst the minorities. You know, growing up in Auckland City, if you saw a group of island boys, you know, when I was at school, there'd always be like a lot of Samoan and Tongan people. And if there was one that was sort of from a different place, it was always either a Nui or a Tukla. <laughs> AKCA is my hometown. Same place where they made Polly Panthers and the same place where they made Bro Town. I haven't been back in about 20 years. I want to go back and I want to run the island. I ran Raro, got off the plane, checked in, checked my bags, changed into my running shoes and I ran the island. I want to do that with Niue because that's where I'm from. You know, it'll mean a, a bit more to me. 531 PI, celebrating New Zealand Music Month. In Wellington, I caught up with Api's sister, Ina. Unlike her brother, she found herself leaving Niue and still adjusting to life under the long white thou. Listening to Island Time 531 PI, the station that brings Pacific people together. I left Niue in mid-2018. That was a really hard decision because I never thought that I would ever leave Niue. I was born in Niue. We spent a few years here in New Zealand, in Auckland, and then I was returned to Niue at the age of seven. What about the climate and stuff here? The climate of Wellington. <laughs> I knew that Wellington was windy, and I moved down here mid-winter. I'm used to wide open green spaces, and then I come to Wellington, which is like a concrete jungle. I miss home. I always miss Niue, but for this time, I'm here doing what I can for my people and eventually the plan is to head back home. One of the things picking up back home is the number of non-Niwean residents. It's helping raise the population and proves you don't have to be Niwean to call it home. I wasn't born here but I came at a very young age. I was eight years old when I came. So I've been here 35 years. Though I'm Fijian, I've lived here most of my life so it's like practically my home now. My dad, he's a carpenter, so he got contracted with five other men to come from Fiji to come and work and uh, build uh, here in uh, Niue. So that's how we came as a family. I love it here. It's the perfect place for me to raise my family. Though we don't have the best facilities and stuff, but there's some sort of peace and contentment just living in Niue. We get people now coming in from Fiji, you know, Tonga, and from the Philippines. And I think that trend uh, will continue. I see the value in having 
people that may not be Niuean by blood, but if you think about it, our communities, people that move to Niue, when they learn the Vangahau, they are more fluent than some of our Tangata Niue that are living outside of Niue. Actor musician Hans Fawai Jackson was born in Aotearoa, but still managed to get himself a Niuean upbringing. So I was caught stealing um, Hot Wheel cars at the warehouse. <laughs> uh, I don't clean them, and that was my one-way ticket to go to New Year. My mum said, yeah, find a way, go stay off your nana. So I went over 2006, I stayed there for three years, and I came back in 2009. It was my last year of primary, and um, my friends were asking, are you, are you going to the islands? He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, do they ride horses over there? I was like, bro, I don't know, bro. He's like, do they live in stick houses? I was like, Bro, I don't know, bro. I, I've never been. So, like, I was I was going with that expectation of, like, bro, I'm going to the WAPs. Like, but got to New York, I was like, oh, shucks, they got twisties here. Oh, they got TVs here. <laughs> so, it was a culture shock for me. So, and it, was, it was real good those three years I, I, I lived there here. A Niuean once told me, Niue is not for the faint hearted. Living off the land sounds cool, but it's hard work. Only one side. I asked my auntie about choosing to stay here when her kids keep telling her to move to New Zealand. So that experience I had at New Ed, I always hold dearly to me because it played a massive part for me in becoming who I am today. A lot of the blessings that I have today. My nana said it all the time. I'm hard on you because I love you. One day you're going to thank me. And I look back today and I say, yes, I thank my nana for all those blessings. And that's what I learned too over in New Year's service. Work hard. Don't, don't expect to get all your blessings today. Just work hard knowing that, you know, just serve. Be that person. So when you're coming here and you're, you, you kind of carry that lifestyle too, you see the difference, you know, with, with youth being raised here and youth that have been raised in New Year. New is a free country with heaps of popoa, heap of bread fruit. Everything is free on the island. So the only advice is to come back home, build your house, bring your kids back home, and you'll be a real Yuan person. More New Wayans are moving back to the island. World-renowned artist and poet John Pule was born in New Way, leaving at the age of two. In 2013, I was invited to go back to Alofi uh, to take part in the, the New Way Arts Festival. And while I was there, a, a friend of mine, Okuso Pavihi, came to see me and he said, look, you are a New Wayan artist, but you don't have a studio here in New Way and I would like you to come back. You belong here. You're living in New Zealand. You are painting things about New Air. You, you are talking about New Air. You're writing poetry about Liku. You're writing history about New Air, but you don't have a base here. And so he helped me clear the pathway for me to go back. And I was able to go back and build a little hut on my father's land. John is now able to live across both countries. He's a New Zealand Arts Laureate and regarded as one of the Pacific's most significant creative voices with exhibitions all over the world. The title of the exhibition is called Haia and Haia is a very common word, you know, used in Niue. It's like an interjection of approval. So when you have a conversation, the person you're talking to will go Haia, leave it at that. You know, everything's okay, you know, takotea. And this exhibition was painted in the old Falipono in Alofi. What I wanted to portray was the beauty of New Air, the beauty of cycling every day into Alofi from Liku and cycling back again on an e-bike. Yeah. <laughs> Many New Air face issues when returning to the Motu. Glenn Jackson was born in New Air, 
moved to New Zealand as a child and returned in his teens. I came back with my mum uh, on a one way to be raised by my grandmother. And so my teens was from 1992 to 2000. You know, people ask, oh, were you born here? Yeah, I was born in Newey. Oh, you can't speak the language. Oh, I just, you know, just felt that, that punch in the gut. You know, so I was having an identity crisis about where I was. I'm dark, I've got thick eyebrows, I've got an English name, English last name, my great-great-grandfather's from England. I can't speak that language. Ugh. After Cyclone Hitta, Glenn returned to New Zealand and started a family. In 2018, he decided to return and raise his kids on the motu. So when you make a decision to move to New Way, people will watch you to see how long you'll last. And for myself thinking, oh no, I'm one of uh, New Way's sons, I was, I was raised here with you guys, you know, um, so I'm coming home. But in coming home much older, people wanted to see how really you were about, can you handle New Way? And then some of the comments are like, oh, we'll, we'll wait to see your container. If you come with your container, then we know you're for real, right? So I'm like, oh snap, they're, they're for real. And then um, the pellets came and that was like, yep, I'm here for real now, I brought my stuff, you know? So that was an interesting time to kind of move back home to Niue. I moved back and built in 2015 and the land trouble pretty much started straight away. And it's all to do with the usual story, New Wayne's family move away and there's no one left to look after the lands. And then one day, someone like me turns up and I have a letter from my jupuna, my matriarch, saying that these lands belong to our family. And of course, there are people there who don't think so because, you know, they have started planting on it. You know, they've, they've looked after it. And so that was been one of the major problems. What's made my case strong is that my tupunas are buried, you know, right next to me. That conversation is happening between family members who live abroad, who don't live here and Leveki will look after the land. And those who are living here are going, they haven't been here for a hundred years. We're gonna, we're, we're going to look after it. And as they look after it, the ones in New Zealand are going, hey, they're, they're taking our land. And so when they come here and fight uh, over land in court, it, it becomes very ugly between family, even family members. I was very fortunate and our family was very fortunate to um, be accepted here. And, uh, you know, we want to build. You have people who want to claim land and they don't build nothing. They just want the land. So, you know, we are people that want to build in our village and want to, you know, yeah. mature it. Diana Fuemana is a playwright and filmmaker. One of her stories was filmed in Niue. Born in Aotearoa, she didn't make it to Niue until later in life. Since then, the intention is hopefully moving back to the motu. How do you feel when you walk here on your family land, on the land of your ancestors? Well, you know, I, I know where the Queen felt all those years. She was Queen of the... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Elizabeth. This is your realm. It's my realm. So my father had moved here in 1996 and he lived here kind of doing our, the land work. And he passed away suddenly in 2000. And so um, I was charged to come over here and settle some of his stuff with my sister. And so that's when I first came to New Year. You know, it's quite hard to come to New Air when you don't have a house. And, you know, my father was able to throw up a hut and live off the grid. And so when he passed, we wanted as a family to be able to continue what he was doing, which was, you know, making a homestead for his kids and grandkids. One of his grandkids, Reed, decided to get married on the island. I wanted to get married in New Air as a declaration of being a New Air. You know, I've spent my whole life saying that I am a fruit salad, but I have always said New Air to Wallow first. Yeah, my mom brought us here 20 years ago as a single mom. That was one of her dreams to bring us home. And ever since we landed and set eyes on this place, I just remember it being a place of home and a sense of belonging and just knowing that this was the true paradise for me. It's a big question. How do we get people to move back home? And I think it's... Yeah, you got to want to, and I think it's up to us. A lot of the people that have lived there before, they're not finna today. Uh, your generation? Or? I think, yeah, a lot of my generation, to be to encourage that, to push that and say, hey, I'm going to go anywhere, that's that's my end goal, that should be yours too, bro. It's an incredible place, right? It's beautiful. Our geography and our fishing and diving is some of the best you'll find in the world. Honestly, I feel like I won the lottery being born 
anyway. For me, when you see the impacts of global consumption and the environmental degradation, you realise that these are the actual gems in the world. Actually being anchored in and close to this incredible ecosystem is pretty special for me. That's definitely what keeps me here, what's made me decide I could raise my kids here, even though they won't have the same education opportunities. Their life skills and their anchoring in our culture, which is very unique and special, is something they will never learn anywhere else. These days, I think a lot about the choice my parents in Tupuna made to leave. Leaving the land of your birth, your manga whaua, knowing you might never return. It wasn't something I thought about much growing up in New Zealand until I first came back. The first time I came back was after 16 years. I was in my early 20s. Because we come to shoot a movie, so I returned with a whole film crew to film a fake wedding here in this village. The whole island thought it was real. It was hard to explain to everyone they were just making a movie. So I was sort of, my headspace was in that area. But when I got off the plane, ah, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what hit me. Something just got me. And I, yeah, I, it was very hard to make it across the tarmac from the aeroplane into the thing. And from then on, it was... Yeah, I didn't, you know, I wasn't... It was just like a hole. I felt a hole again coming back and we shot that film and uh, that was about a month and then we had to leave and then leaving that second time was that was hard too it was harder, you know it just got harder and harder I didn't get to New Year until I was over 50 I didn't think I'd ever get back there you know getting on and all of that kind of thing and I never thought that I'd ever get back there got myself together psyched up and all that on the plane and I looked down at this tiny little jewel in the middle of the ocean. This is the land that my mum and dad came from and they left. Got off the plane, the first thing I did, I kissed the ground. I'm home and I felt it, I'm home. Little did I know that it was tarmac and a bit of stone. <laughs> yeah. There is something about new air and I think a lot of new Wayans feel it even the ones that haven't been here. It's home. Like, you know, you, for me, it was like, I have to go back home because that was my, New Year's my sense of belonging. I met uh, Uru Motua um, in Mutalai, who told me who I am. Mehe tumutumuaki uru hao ke to alo alo hui kwe New koe. That to me meant everything. At last, I know who I am. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I am a Niue. Many of us like to call Niue home, but the reality is that most of us live in Aotearoa. With more and more leaving, the future of Niue's cultural maintenance might be in places like the epic high school's cultural festival, Polyfest. So having a Niue stage on its own, right? And it's also the first stage, as soon as you enter and bang, you see that bright yellow flag, it's super important. We are a bit of the underdog, numbers and also just our people in general a bit more humble, uh, but more conservative uh, culturally. The young Nguyen's here, we struggle, right, with our culture and our language and it's like, you just look at the stats, there's 11% of us out of all of the Nguyen's in New Zealand and Niue that can speak Vanho Niue. So certainly I think Polyfest has done a, an incredible job in terms of giving Nguyen people a platform to, to practice and share and celebrate the, the Nguyen culture and language but there's so much more to be done, right? We are still struggling, and that's very clear. And so I think, yes, there's a 50 year celebration this year, but I'm interested as well, what are we gonna do next? Like, what's next for us as Niue people? If you look at our people here in New Zealand, we're the worst performers economically in terms of employment, uh, educational qualifications, jobs. We haven't done that well. You could argue, what are we celebrating? And if you're talking about statistics, it's the brown country's languages that are most at risk because of their expectation to assimilate. And we took on board the education system, which was on a curriculum of New Zealand. And with the language went a lot of that cultural identity and pride. And it's now taking how many generations to reclaim all of that? And it also makes us rethink whether that was the best option. Yeah, for advice, I advice how to in New Zealand, I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I
Now, when it comes to conversations that I've heard of, you are not Nguyen or you're not Tangata Nguyen unless you speak the language. And I've heard that. And, I, and I've heard people use that as the reason why they won't even attempt to go to night schools or go to um, uh, learning schools to, to pick up the language. As I got older, I, I started to dread in certain ways just because I was scared and, and how the people on the island might react to me as, as not being full new air. I don't know what it is to be 100% Nguyen because I'm not and I accept that but I'm learning you know what I mean but a lot of older heads they're going to look at me and just be like you're not Nguyen you can't even bang a hole you can't even speak the language you haven't even been to the island in, since you were a baby so what makes you Nguyen you know like speaking down on us and stuff just be more accepting we ain't got much to work with so <laughs> That's all you got, mate. Let's help each other out so we can all get on the same page. The more that I engage with our New Zealand born Nguyen's, the more hopeful and optimistic I am with this generation. So we can't change the ways of our Matuas and how they think. They had different sets of challenges that have shaped the way that they see the world. And that's why sometimes it comes across as harsh. Nobody can tell you who you are or who you aren't. The only person that can define who you are is yourself. There are no people that can say, that I'm full new way in. I'm a mixed blend. What does that look like? How do we honour both cultures? No one's going to tell me I'm not New Ayan, even though I don't live on the island. And we're just going to be much more inclusive and accepting of the fact that some New Ayans are going to live in Melbourne, some in Auckland and some in Newey. We're just going to build those pathways and connections and, and enable and support people to contribute. Here in New Zealand and Australia, or whatever, they need to have those lessons in order to maintain. Because if we lose our language, that means we'll lose our identity. It's simple as that. When I first came back from New Air and I moved back to New Zealand, I made sure that everyone knew I was New Air carry the flag with me everywhere. And I make sure too that everyone in the room knows that I'm Nguyen. One of the conversations that I had with a artist in New Zealand uh, of Nguyen descent, I said, hey, I know you're proud of your, your newer culture. He goes, nah, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed because, because wherever I go and people talk to me, I, uh, I, I can't speak back. And I said, do this, do this. And the next time you go live and all your videos that you're doing, just hang the new flag in your, in your music video. He goes, yeah. I goes, they don't need to know that you can't speak it. Soon as people visually see the new flag behind you and your music video, you don't even have to mention new way. If they visually see the gold flag, they're gonna be like, proud new end. That's enough. And for me, acknowledging is enough. There are many stories of young new Wayans doing well, including Duke and Williams, whom if new way wasn't late registering for the Olympics, could have been fighting in Paris in 2024. I'm thankful for everything that I've accomplished as a new boxer. When I first started boxing, it was always just like a dream or just like a goal to fight at the Commonwealth Games. I always had in the back of my mind to want to fight for New Year. Being New Year means to me I get to be myself and I get to represent for the people, and that's my people. Being a New Year to me means being proud of where I come from, honouring those who came before me, and making my ancestors proud. Being proud of where you're from, being proud of who you are, no matter where you are in the world, that's what it means to be New Ayan. And also to be defiant. That's what we stem from, eh? We told Cook to fuck off. 
I'm proud that we don't have our white sandy beaches. I'm proud that Savage Cook got chased away the first time. I'm, I'm proud that, you know, our population is so small in the world, but on a global scale, we are everywhere. I'm one of many New Wayans that have worked hard to get to where I have, and I have always, you know, not only given glory to God, but give glory to the people who live here in New Wayans and continue to do it for us, so we have a place to come home to. I think we need to celebrate because there were dire predictions uh, in 1974 that it was only a matter of time before the last person to leave the island will have to turn out the lights. Well, if you look around the island now, it's still here. We're still very much alive. The population is still small, but there's a community feel to the island. If you think about the Dongata Niue and uh, our contributions, not only to our island, but to this region and to the world per capita, I mean, we punch way above our weight. For a small nation, we have done so much. We have added a lot to this country. Small as we are, we've added to the fabric of this nation. If you want to live in an island, you have to accept that you're on an island. That shouldn't be the case. We should be looking at it as like, we are in Niue, we're enjoying the same benefits and opportunities as those in Auckland, Wellington, Sydney. That's my dream for, for my kids and encompasses everyone. When we first came to New Zealand, speaking the Wayan wasn't encouraged. And then now, it's gone full circle and most of the work that I get is because I can speak New Wayan. There's a lot more people now claiming their New Wayaness and claiming their culture than say, when I was growing up. It gives you hope. It gives me hope. I'm celebrating resilience. The sacrifices made to get here. Having somewhere to call home and an awareness of the dire situation we're in and the solutions so far set in place. I'm celebrating hope. We may not have bitten the bullet, but I think we have an idea of what it tastes like. And what we do with that knowing is up to us. Monu tangaloa, kitu kitu ea. Oh